Jesus said it best, in this life, you will encounter trials and tribulations. What is that trial? It's a time that tests everything that you know. It's a time that tests your faith. It's a time that tests your determination. It's a time that tests you. We can sit here and try to rebuke the trial. In the name of Jesus, I pray that the trial will go away. God will not dismiss your trial. And now, with today's word, Pastor Tyrone Morrison. Amen. How many brought your Bibles this morning? Amen. Amen. The Bible's the basic instructions before leaving earth. If you brought your Bibles, would you turn with me to Genesis 15? We're going to look at verses 1 to 6. Genesis 15, verses 1 to 6. And I want to continue off of a subject that I began a couple weeks ago where we talked about the power of a paradigm shift. I'll say that again. The power of a paradigm shift. And I want to specifically focus on the power of a God-given vision. How many know we got to have vision? How many know that without vision, people cast off restraint? We got to have a God-given vision. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you, Lord, that your word says where two or three are gathered together in your name, that you are there in the midst of them, Father. So we thank you that you are in the midst of us this morning, Father. I thank you that you have prepared our ears to hear. You said, blessed are those who have ears to hear. So we thank you, Father, that we have ears to hear, that we can correctly hear your instruction and your word this morning. Help me rightly divide the word of truth this morning. In Jesus' name, all who agree said, amen and amen. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring." Indeed, the one born of my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside. I want to say that again. Then he brought him outside. Say that again. Then he brought him outside. And he says, look now towards the heavens. So he redirects his attention. And he says, count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Here's the key now in verse 6. He says, and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. I'll say that again. And he what? Believed who? Who he believed? Are you believing the Lord this morning? And he believed the Lord and he, meaning God, counted him for righteousness. The last couple, last time I was with you, we spent some time talking about a paradigm shift. And here we learn that a paradigm is a set of presumptions ideas and standards and behaviors that shape a way of thinking and comprehending certain topics or situations. You know, we learned that we all have a paradigm. Everyone in this room has a paradigm in which we have lived and fashioned our lives after. We have a mental image, a a, a map, a mental map that we have used in our life. And to a degree, it may have been successful to this point. But how many know that if you want to elevate, if you want to go higher, if you want to be successful in the next area of your life, you cannot continue to operate off of the same old map. We have to change our mental map. 
We use the example of, you know, if we have a, a map of Minnesota, that's great for Minnesota. But I can't go to Chicago or to New York or to Orlando, to Florida with the map of Minnesota. I can't do that. I'll get frustrated every single time. You will get lost because you're operating based off of the wrong map. I got to change my map. I got to change my paradigm. We have to change our paradigm if we want to go to the next level. And we spent some time examining the story of Joshua and Caleb in Numbers chapter 13, verses 26 to 33, where we see Moses send 12 spies into the promised land, and really 10 of them came back with a bad report. The 10 really represented the status quo. That represented the, the nation of Israel. But Joshua and Caleb had a different spirit about them. They had a different paradigm about them. See, the, 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 the Israelites, they went in and they saw the grapes. They came back with the grapes. They said, here, it is good for the take. These are the grapes. It is luxurious. It is ripe. This is a good fruit. So you came back with evidence. But still, their mentality could not see them having the evidence. They saw themselves as unable. They saw themselves as inadequate. They saw themselves as seeing the, prob the problem bigger than the promise. But Joshua and Caleb had a different mindset about them. They saw themselves as well able. They said, we are well able to take this land. Yes, there is all the, the Hittites, the Jebusites, all of these ites, the, 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 the giants that are in the land. But we are able to take them. So we talked about how we, in order for us to shift our paradigm, you got to see yourself moving from being unable to being well able. How many know that you are well able? Amen. We got to stop that negative self-talk saying, I can't do this. I won't do it. If you keep on telling yourself that, you won't ever do it. You got to see yourself as well able. And you got to see yourself as, as adequate, as having a positive self-esteem and a self-image. How do you see yourself? When you look in, your, in the mirror, how do you see yourself? The Israelites saw themselves as little in their problem as big. They saw themselves as grasshoppers. But then we saw how Joshua and Caleb magnified the promise over the problem. They saw, they said, look, we have the evidence. It is ripe for the taking. We can take this land and live in this land. We can do it. They're magnifying the promise over the problem. But too many people settle with the problem and magnify the problem and, for, and, and then they just give up on the promise. God does not want you to give up on the promise. See, even though God's given you a promise does not mean that you're not going to run into problems. In life, you will have problems. I said, in life, you can start to pray it away, you can rebuke it away, but you're going to have problems. But it's your ability to solve problems that qualifies you to obtain the promise. Yeah. Amen. So we're going to continue this subject this morning. And I want to continue this subject and speak about having a God-given vision. I'll say it again. You need to have a god given vision. See, having a God-given vision, it plays a significant role in shifting your paradigm. Because this is here. God-given vision is centered around your purpose for your life. See, a lot of times we can talk about vision, but we're seeing that, see, without a God-given vision, you're really having a limited type of vision that's limited to your sight and limited to how you, how you see things and just your goals. But you know what? God's vision is much bigger than your personal vision. I said God's vision for your life 
is much bigger than what your personal vision is. God's vision, it's centered around your, our purpose for life, and it causes us to leave what is familiar and comfortable and pursue what he has for us, causing us to believe him by faith. It takes faith. God's given vision does not make sense to you at times. It takes faith because it'll go against everything that sight, that natural sight says for you or what common sense may say to you. It takes faith. By faith, we walk by faith and not by what? We walk by faith and not by sight. But also, it has you believe God by faith depending on his instruction for us. And when we do this, it can cause you to be at rest. You can move from being worried about tomorrow to being at total peace and at rest when you're pursuing the purpose and the vision that God has for your life. I'll say that again. You can move from being anxious, from being, from being worried, to being at peace. Because you know that God's got you, right? And you're pursuing the vision and the purpose that he has, that he has, that he has, that he has. You can have your plan, but God has his plan that he has for your life. So as we're looking at a story, this, this part in the passage, this comes shortly after Abram came back from rescuing his cousin Lot after he gave tithe, and after he gave tithes to Melchizedek, see, he gave tithes to Melchizedek, realizing that it was God that, was, that, had, that had him do this. It was God that gave him the wealth. It, it was God that gave him the victory. Some people need to hear that again. It's God that gave you the wealth. It's God that gave you the business. It's God that gave you the victory. So the tithe belongs to the Lord. And we're honoring the Lord. Abram said that if I don't do this, man will think I did this by myself. You're limited when you're trying to think that you did it by your own merit. God did this for him. So he tithed. And at this point, it, it, it looked like he had it all together. He acquired wealth. He was operating in the, in the blessing, but Abram had a concern. He said, I've, I've acquired all this because, remember, he, the Bible says that he was rich in cattle, that he was rich in silver and in gold. God had caused him to be prosperous. So he's acquired all of this wealth, and he's now thinking, who can I pass this on to? And it, it, who can I leave this, this, this legacy and this inheritance to? And now... I can respect Abram's concern here because he was operating in God's blessing, but he was concerned about who he can pass this on to. I need a child. I need an heir or somebody of my own lineage that I can pass this on to. If you don't give this to me, Lord, I got to give it to Eleazar. And mind you, at that time, it was, a shame, it was shameful for man, for a successful person to not have an heir to pass on an inheritance to, let alone a son to pass along an inheritance to, because a son would inherit the business. So it was a shameful thing in that honor and shame society that they lived in. So I can respect and I understand his perspective. I, you, Lord, Lord, you blessed me. I need somebody to continue this on for me. So although he was doing all the right things, he was thinking in the right way, the problem was he was still thinking too small. So he's coming to God with this concern because, Lord, you said that you would bless me and make me a great nation. You said that, this, that, that my name would be great. How can this happen if I don't even have an heir to pass this to? How can this happen? How can, how can I fulfill this prophecy that you gave me in Genesis 12? How can that be fulfilled if I don't have somebody to pass this on to? And that's when God 
brought him outside. And he had, he had many reasons to do this, especially that him and his wife, Sarah, were nearing the age where they could not bear children. Then that needed a miracle. But although Abram was doing all these things, the problem was his thinking was still too small. And because his thinking was still too small, God had to shift his paradigm and bring him outside so that he could see the vision. So there's a difference, as I mentioned before, a difference between a personal vision and a God-given vision. See, a personal vision is a mental image or idea of what the future could be like. This can be inspired by your personal goals, your values, your beliefs. But see, personal vision oftentimes can be, can be uh, influenced by just your sight. I love what Dr. Miles Monroe said one time. He said, sight is a function of the eyes, but vision is a function of your heart. When God gives you vision, it's a function of your heart. It goes beyond sight. It goes beyond your sight. We can have a personal vision. We have our goals. It's healthy to have your goals. Please write down goals. The Bible says that a wise man plans. It is important for you to have a goal. It's important for you to have a where you want to be five years from now, two years from now, one month, you know, one year from now, a couple months from now. It's important to write to have that clear. It is important to have a, a personal vision as well. I'm not saying don't have a personal vision, but we also need to have a God-given vision. See, a God-given vision or a revelation of God is not, is, is not just having an image of the future. It is tied to your purpose in life, why you are here. Have you ever asked the question, why am I here? You are here on purpose. God doesn't do things by chance or by accident. It is a divine purpose to why you are here. There is a purpose for your life. And it is very important to begin to understand your purpose and discover and understand your purpose because as Miles Monroe once again said, where purpose is is, is unknown, abuse is inevitable. We begin abusing our lives and living our lives without any type of conduct or order because we don't understand purpose. We got to understand our purpose. You have a purpose in life. God has given you a purpose for your life. And that purpose has been established since before you were even conceived in your mother's womb. Jeremiah says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. You were, even, you were in the mind of God before he put, this, he put you in your mother's womb. Before he formed you in his mother's womb, God was thinking about you. God had a plan for you. He had a purpose. He knew when to put you, what time frame in the history of humanity when to put you here. That's how detailed God is with his vision. He know when you need to be here, how long your lifespan will be, because he knew that the end from the beginning. He knows the plans that he has for you. Plans to give you a purpose, to give you a future. It is in the mind of God. So that should tell you something. Real vision, a revelation, comes from God. A real vision comes from from God. God is the source of that vision. So in order for us to discover our vision and our purpose, who do we need to seek? God, because it comes from God. He knows he has a plan. And he says, I have already ordained you to be a prophet for a nation. So I already call, I already set you apart. I've already chosen your vocation. I've already picked it. You need to get in line with it. (laughs) <laughs> oh, I got quiet in this house. God's already picked what he has called you to do. He's already assigned you. He's put every gift and talent and ability inside of you. You got to discover that now. And you need to get in alignment. Have you ever had driven a car that's out of alignment? Things don't function when they're out of alignment. We got to get in a 
alignment with God. He has a purpose for your life. He has a vision for your life. And there's a few things that having a God-given vision and understanding our purpose does for us. Number one, and write these down, it focuses your life. It focuses your life. You have a clear sense of direction. You're not going to part, when you understand your vision and your purpose, you're not going to participate in things that diminish the value of that thing. I'm not going to hang around people that ain't going nowhere. I'm not going to associate my thing, myself with things that does not attribute to my mission and my vision. If I do that, you are wasting my time. Time is one of the most valuable things that God has ever given you. Is your time. You have 24 hours in the day, seven days a week. Young people, even though you, they say you have plenty of time, guess what? You don't. That is one of the biggest lies that is passed on from generation to generation. You got all this time to party. You got all this time. No, this is your time to get ahead. This is a time to be, choose your friends carefully. Where are they going? Do, you have, do they have a vision for their life? Do they value you? Do they value themselves? Come on. Uh, the Bible says that those who are wise hang around with the wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. If you hang around five stupid people, you'll be the sixth. But if you hang around five smart people, you will be the sixth. I could tell the future by the people that you hang around and by the, by the books that you read. It brings focus to your life. Understanding your vision and mission and your purpose brings focus to your life. Number two, it motivates your life. With purpose, oftentimes comes passion. Are you passionate about what you do? I got up this morning, and I'm passionate this morning because I'm operating in line with purpose. God's given me a word to share with you to cause you to shift your perspective and shift your paradigm. Because in order for you to live the life that you're meant to live, you got to shift this thing. So I'm passionate about what I'm saying. That passion drives you. That is like the fuel to your car, to your engine. That is the thing that is going to drive you. So many people are living life without passion because they don't know purpose. Oh, this is just life. Oh, this is just the way that they are. There is no zeal for their life. Don't put yourself around people who have lost that zeal for their life. It's contagious. It is contagious. Just hopeless living. With purpose comes passion. But number three, it prepares you for eternity. There will be a day when we all have to sit before God. And he's going to ask you, did you do what I asked you to do? Did you do what I assigned for you to do? And the Bible says, many come to him saying, Lord, Lord, I did this. I did this in your name. I fed the people. I helped out here. I was a good purpose person. But he said, flee from me, for I did not know you. You did not know me. You didn't do the thing that I asked for you to do. If there's one thing that causes me to have the fear of God, it's that. Because while I'm here, God has given me time. He's given you all the opportunity. He's given you all the resources. He's given you everything that you can ever ask God for. He's already given you. He's put it in the earth. He's given you the time, space, and opportunity. You want to talk about equity? That's it. You want to talk about equity? Time, space, and opportunity. It's it. This is a divine principle. 
What are you doing with it? Are you spending time complaining, pointing at the finger, blaming everybody else for your problem? Are you looking at yourself saying, how I can be better? How can I do this? How can I step into my purpose? How can I, how can I do this? Because at the end of the day, i got to face God. And if I don't answer that call, he has the power to send me down to hell, even though I confessed you all day long. I shouted at church. I did all this stuff, but I didn't do what you assigned me to do. I could not receive my well done, my good and faithful. Because you, oper- you weren't operating by his purpose and his vision for your life. It prepares you for eternity. I love what Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no revelation, in other words, vision, Of who? God. A godly vision. I said a God-given vision. Because you can have a personal vision, but still cast off restraint. Where there's no revelation of God, people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. You got to understand this vision, God-given vision and purpose that God has for your life. As we look at Abram's purpose, we see that in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12, 1 to 3 says, Now the the Lord said to Abram, he's giving him a revelation, a vision, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. So he didn't know where he was going, but God knew where he was going. To a land that I will show you. I, not you, I, not you, I, will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a what? So God doesn't just bless you for the sake of you. He blessed you to be a blessing. So in this passage right here, he's showing Abram his purpose. I want to cause you to be a blessing, referring to how he's looking for somebody that he can establish his covenant with in the earth. I'm blessing you. I'm causing you to be successful. I'm causing you to be fruitful and multiply so you can establish my intention, my plan in the earth. That's your purpose, Abram. I'm causing you to be a blessing. To be a blessing. I'm causing you to be a blessing, and you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and in you. So now it's pointing to the seed of Abraham. Really, when God's speaking to Abraham, he's speaking to himself. He's speaking to Christ, (laughs) because throughout Abraham's lineage, Jesus Christ would come about, and all who believed in him and believe that that's how we, we are saved, by believing in Jesus, believing in God, that now we can participate in the Abrahamic blessing. And now we, we have a better promise with it, which is eternal life. All throughout the world, all those in the world shall be blessed through you. <laughs> all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It was, he was purpose, and God has blessed him to be a blessing. He needed somebody to come in agreement with to establish his covenant in the earth. But in order for that blessing to work, it has to have something to do with. God needs us to be vessels so that he can, oper- we can, he can operate through us. God's just not saying, I'm going to bless you, and you do nothing. We praise him, God bless me, hallelujah, God bless me, I'm blessed, as it's attributed to a feeling. <laughs> you can get encouraged, you can have, you know, just be inspired, but what are you doing with that inspiration? Abram was not just somebody wandering around the desert. You know that he had businesses. He was a sheep herder. He also had a well business. And God utilized that business and caused that biz- those businesses to be successful. God's, when God says his favor, his blessing will come upon you, he's talking about his hand that is coming upon your hand. And, the, and, the, and your hands, whatever you touch, shall be blessed. You're saying, bless me? God said, I've already blessed you. I'm just activating that blessing. 
that's already inside of you. It's already inside of you. I said, it's already inside of you. He had multiple businesses. God was able to put his hand and favor upon him and caused it to prosper. Your purpose is not just for you to be served. Your purpose is to serve others. It's for you to be of service. Not only was his purpose to be a blessing, it was also that all humanity could be blessed in and through him for generations to come. At this point, like I said, Abraham was blessed. Financially, he was set. The finances were working. I mean, he was blessed wherever he was going, even when he went to Egypt when he wasn't supposed to go. Even when he lied about Sarah being his sister. <laughs> and so much to the fact that the Pharaoh fell in love with his wife and almost committed adultery and said, you know what, how could you do this because you lied to me. So there was a blessing on Sarah too, on his household. But even though he lied, the Bible says he still became wealthy, and God has given him the ability to create wealth. Did you know that God has given you the ability to create wealth? I'll say that again. God has given you the ability to create wealth. Wealth is inside of you. Wealth is inside of you. The difference between the rich and the poor is the rich learned how to accumulate, how to develop, how to make that wealth come out. It's in you. Creative ideas is in you. The ability to manage resources is in you. It is in you. It is in you. In you, now to him who was able to do exceedingly abundantly above all, according to the work that is what? In you. It's in you. It's in you. Wealth is in you. God's no favor of persons. He's not, that doesn't matter what side of the, st the street that you're born on. He is not a favor of persons. If you start activating these principles that God has in, in the B I B L E, Favor will follow you all the days of your life. It is in you. So he was blessed. He was tithing. He was doing everything that he was supposed to do. But the problem was he was still thinking too small. I don't have an heir. I don't have this. I don't have that. You're thinking too small when you start saying, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have this. Now, he was right in what he was thinking, but he still was thinking too small. You can be right in how you're thinking, but still be thinking wrong. This happened so much to the fact that God had to bring him outside. See, for us to shift our paradigm and receive our God-given vision. This is what we got to do. We must come outside. We got to come outside. What does that mean, to come outside? We must leave our comfort zone and our conformed way of thinking. You have a conformed way of thinking. Somebody told you how to think. You've been taught and how to think. Somebody told you, what, define what clothes you're wearing today. Where do you think trends come from? Somebody said, this is what's acceptable. We could just do this and dress, dress this way and behave that. Somebody told you how to think. So it's challenging you. When we come outside, we got to leave our comfort zone and conform way of thinking, moving from what we understand and come to a place where we have to completely trust God. See, I, I, I've noticed this pattern with Abram. God's always telling him to come out of something. Re realize in Genesis 12, when God first revealed himself to Abram, and he, he instructs them to leave his father's house. Uh, and and I, I question, I'm like, God, why are you telling him to leave his father's house? Why are you calling call him to leave his family, those who he loved, those who he, he was kin to? And he brought me back to the chapter before when he talked about his father, Terah. 
God had his father, Terah, leave the Earl of the Chaldeans, and he had a destination called Canaan. Canaan was actually the place that God was leading Abram to. Right? But the Bible says that Terah settled in Haran. He settled in Haran. See, we cannot settle. There's a problem when we settle. He settled in Haran. Terra simply settled in a place that was temporary and not the final destination. How many people are settling for less? How many people are settling for bad relationships? How many people are settling for being broke? You settled. You gave up on your dream. You gave up on that, on, that, on that vision. You got comfortable with how things are. This is just the way that things are. Who said this is just the way that things are? He settled. Oftentimes, God will cause us to lead people in places and relationships that has settled. There's some of us guys saying, leave that job, you settled. You're no longer growing there. You're no longer being challenged. You know you're not happy there. You know you're not happy in that relationship that has just caused you to be blah, 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 and just settle where there's no vision. What is the vision for that relationship? Where are you going? Is, is there, are you with that guy to be with that guy, or is there a marriage? Is there a, a, a wedding day planned already? You've been married 10, ten, you've been together 10 years, and there's still no ring. Guess what? Guys, it doesn't take that long. The vision starts with you, fellas. You got to have the vision to define a relationship, too. That's a free one. You got you to gotta get out of the place of being settled. Settled, I'm just comfortable with how, how I've, I've achieved. There's still more to life than, 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 what, you've, than what you've already done. There's still more to life. You're in trouble when you start settling. Oh, I'm just, I'm just done. I'm done working now. No, when you're done working, you're dead. <laughs> now, retirement means that your, your assets have, have accumulated so much that you no longer have to go paycheck to paycheck, right? That's the definition of retirement, but it never means stop working. God created work. Why would he ever have you stop working? Now you have, other, you have a chance to pursue other passions and other things that you want to do, but you're still moving. The day you stop moving is when you're dead. Stop settling. I rebuke the spirit of settling in the name of Jesus. I rebuke the spirit of settling in the name of Jesus. God does not want you to settle. There is still more to conquer. You have not you have not taken all of the land and properties and investments that, you, that he has for you. Somewhere along the line, you've settled. Do not settle for Haran when God has given you Canaan. That ought to get you shouting this morning. See, why do people settle? One is because of fear. You're afraid. You're afraid of taking a chance. You're afraid of the unknown. You're afraid of, of all this. Guess what fear is? It's false evidence that appears real. That's what fear is. And guess what? God did not give you a spirit of fear, but power, hope, and a what? Sound mind. Fear stops people, has people settle. A low self-esteem. Has people settle? Social pressure. Did you settle for that man? Because everybody was pressuring you. You didn't have one yet. You didn't have one yet. You didn't have one yet. Did you settle for that when you knew that that wasn't God's best for you? Or that woman? Or that job just because you just needed a job? And you, hey, I just needed to pay the bills, but it's not in line with purpose? Did you settle? Did you settle? That's why you're not happy, because you settle. <laughs> you're not happy because you Settled for this. Just good enough. No, good enough is not good enough. 
you got to stop settling. Low self-esteem, having grown comfortable with where you're at. Whatever the case may be, God has not called you to settle and to conform. Instead, he has called you to be set apart and transform. Transform. Genesis 15, God tells Abram to come outside, and he had to leave his tent. In other words, he had to come out of his limited sight. His sight was limited to what he understood. And watch this. Once he got outside, God caused him to look to the heavens. Look up. Look up. You're looking at everything else from this perspective. But by faith, God calls you to look up. And he says, count the stars if you can. Not just count the stars, if you can. So there's so many other stars that goes beyond your sight. Count the stars if you can. And he says, so shall your descendants be. In other words, my vision for you transcends your sight. It goes, by, goes beyond your sight. Your sight, if it's your vision, it dies with you. But my vision will go on for generations to come. It is your sight. you got to look up and see the stars. How many know that God has a vision and a purpose for you? Somehow God has a vision and a purpose for you. It's going to live beyond you. You know, I love the story with, with Walt Disney and, you know, when he built Disney World. How many know that he did not see Disney World? Disney World was complete after he died. And, and they interviewed his wife one time and he, while they were opening, and, she, and they said, it wouldn't it be great for Walt to see this? And she said, you know what? He already did. It was in his eyes. He was already there. He was already there. He was already there. And now, Disney World is even bigger. It's all over the world. See, that's the power of vision. Now, it's, you, might, you might not agree with everything about Disney, but somebody who was secular understood the principle of the power of a vision. And it was around his motivation, his why, his purpose was around families getting together and having a good time. It was not thinking just about his family and his kids didn't have a place to go. He said, how can I make something and create something where all families all over the world can come and have a good time? And guess what? If you've ever been to Disney World, you have a good time. They have something about it. They call it a magical place where grown people become little kids. I remember the first time when my, I brought my wife there and talk about a grown woman who became a little girl once she saw Cinderella. <laughs> this, this grown, anointed woman of God was pushing little girls aside to get a picture with. <laughs> <laughs> but see, it taps into your imagination, right? That's a vision. See, he has a vision for your life. And see, for us to shift our paradigm, we must come to believe that vision God has for us. Genesis 15, 6, it says, and he believed the Lord, and he accounted him for righteousness. Dr. Miles Monroe once said in his book entitled The Principles and Power of Vision, he said, purpose is when you know and understand what you were born to do. And a vision is when you can see it in your mind by faith and begin to imagine it. See, it's when you begin to see it in your mind and in your heart, that's when you begin to believe it. You got to see it. So many people are living with sight but not vision. You don't see it. You got to see it. When we believe something, this means that we have come in agreement with that thing. And it's our beliefs that dictates our attitudes. It dictates our behaviors. And even how we interact with people, your belief system, you believe in it. So here it says that Abram believed God. In other words, because he believed God, he, his belief shaped how he related to God and others. 
and it shaped how he conducted himself. You start acting different when you see and believe the vision that God has for you. You start, act, you start acting different. There's just something that changes within you. you start, it starts shaping things around you. It starts, you know, affecting your attitude, how you see and understand the life and how you see and understand how to relate to other people, how your, your behavioral actions start to change. Even how you dress yourself changes. Even how you walk changes. Because I'm dressed like this. Why am I dressed like this? Because I got to work and I, got, I know where I'm going. I have to dress for the occasion for where I'm going. How many know heard the saying that you had, says that you have to dress for success? So in other words, you can't wear yesterday's clothes and tomorrow's blessing. You cannot wear yesterday's clothes. You got to dress the occasion. God caused Joseph to change his clothes. Your conduct, how you present yourself matters. 90% of what you communicate is not by words. I can tell you're serious. If you, if you just get up and out of bed, you don't do your hair, you don't do nothing, put, don't make up on, don't do, don't do nothing and say, Lord, this is just as I am. Hallelujah, that's a, that's a free one this morning. I got to finish up right quick here. Y'all receiving something this morning? There's a few things that we got to do when we're believing this vision. Number one, you got to see it. You got to see it by faith. You got to see it before it happens. See yourself there. You got to see it. Get that picture in your mind of where you want to be. Get that picture in your mind living in that place, building that business, doing that thing that God's called you to do. Get a good picture in your mind, and you got to see it. You have to see it. Number two, you got to write it down. Habakkuk 2.2 2 says, write the vision down and make it plain. You have to write it down. And make it clear enough for the runner to run with it. You're not the only one who is to understand the God-given vision. When it's a God-given vision, he will have other people that participate with that vision in order for that vision to come to reality. If it is not clear, it will die with you. God's vision is not just your personal vision. This is a bigger vision that includes many other people to come alongside and help you build the vision. <laughs> Number three, you got to speak it. Scripture says that God spoke things that be not as though they were. You have to change your language and start speaking it like you're already there. Like it's coming to pass. You have to speak it. Number four, be it. You got to embody the values that you want to see happening. You have to embody the vision. Because when God calls you to leadership, they need somebody to embody what, they, what, what their leadership is about, what that vision's about. You got to embody it. Number five, live it. You got to start living as if it's not, if, although it's not there yet, you got to start already acting, talking, walking, living as if it's there. And when you start doing this, then you can start bringing that into reality because you've already been there. As I said, Walt Disney was already there before Disney World was built. It was in his mind. He was acting. He said it needs to be like this, like that. There's video of him saying that Disney World is, will have these, these different lands here. And it's, over time, it's going to be building and building and building. And guess what? They're still building. He's been dead for a long time. What they say, 50 years for Disney World last year? That's as long as he's been gone. <laughs> but his vision is still living. Real quickly, for us to shift our paradigm and receive God's vision, we must allow the we must follow the instructions God has given us. As I continued to study this passage, I couldn't help but notice how God 
would tell Abram how he would inherit the land and God has pro- what God has promised him. Moreover, in verse 8, Abram asked this simple question. He says, how? How? That's a very reasonable question. How? And this is what God says in verses 9 to 11. He says it got, God has given him specific instructions to which he, he had to get the animals, the specific animals, to offer as a sacrifice to the Lord. He was to offer up a heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. He was to go and gather. It means he had to go and kill off those, those animals. He had to go to work. And then it also says that, that Abram had to fend off all the, all the pigeons, all, all, all the other birds. In other words, while you're doing the vision, you're building the vision, there's some people you got to fend off. The buzzards, people that have no vision, that just sit around dead things, you got to fend off. But then as he did this, the scripture to- shows us that God causes him to fall asleep now. Now, while he's asleep, the Bible says that the Spirit of God came between them like a fire and consumed the sacrifice. See, we sing all the time, you deserve, you provide the fire, I provide the sacrifice. That's what passes what he's talking about. You provide the sacrifice. See, we want God's promises with no sacrifice. You're not going to get the promise without the sacrifice. He had to build a sacrifice unto the Lord. Same thing when he offers his son Isaac on the altar. He had to go and build, build, a, sacri- build a sacrifice. God said, bring your son up there. So he's building the altar. Son saying, where's the wood? But what is he saying all the time? God will provide. God will provide. God will provide. God will provide. And as he was building it, about to kill his son, Somewhere in the thicket of the, uh, of, with the, was a ram with his, his horns caught, and God provided the ram. God was looking for his obedience, and that's what ca- caused him to be qualified to be the father of many nations and not just a great father, which was what Abram meant, his name. He caused him to be Abraham and a father of many nations. You got to be willing to follow the instructions and have obedience with those instructions. And once he was able to do that back in Genesis 15, he could rest. Now, I wouldn't say that dream was a good dream (laughs) because that showed what his people would go through. But he says, be be, be not afraid. I'm going to bring them back to this land, and they're going to prosper. See, it's interesting. The story began with him being concerned. But it ends with him being asleep. When you're following the vision and the purpose God has for your life, you can, have, you can begin being concerned, but God will cause you to go to sleep. In other words, when you're pursuing his purpose for your life, although all hell might be breaking loose, this doesn't make sense. I could still sleep at night. I sleep at night. At 9 o'clock is bedtime. Sleep at night. <laughs> Ain't nothing good happen at, at midnight. No, what you all up in there for? You got to sleep at night. There's a reason why the sun is down at night. Go to sleep. And you can have this peace and this peace. You don't have to worry about a thing. Be, you don't have to worry about a thing. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything through prayer and supplication, make your request be made known that the peace that surpasses, surpasses all, all of our what? Sight, our understanding can guard our hearts and minds, hearts and minds. Don't let this stuff get into your heart. Don't let bitterness get into your heart. Don't let strife, don't let fear, don't let all that stuff get into your heart. Instead, we exchange that with God and believe him and trust in him in all of our ways. And he starts directing our path. You can be asleep. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 6, 33, he says, why you worry about tomorrow? You're sitting about worry about where's the food going to come from, where all this is going to come from, where, how am I going to do this? He said, look at the ants, look at the, look at the ants. Does not God provide for them? How much more 
how much more will your God provide for you? Instead, he says, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, right? For, seek first, so your priority should be pursuing the vision and mission that God has for your life. Now, that's not just saying, oh, I'm just reading my Bible. I'm just going to church. That's part of it. But, you know, it's, it's pursuing. It's what your pursuit is. Your pursuit needs to be after his vision and his mission for your life. And as a result of that, God says, now I can provide all of your needs. Now, now I will give you all of these things besides. <laughs> so why are you worried about? Amen? So... In closing, we got to have a God-given vision. And what that does is that shifts our paradigm because a God-given vision is centered around our purpose for our lives. It causes us to leave the familiar and pursue what God has for us, causing us to believe God by faith, depending on his instructions for our lives, which as a result can cause us to be at rest. Did you receive something this morning? We got to have a vision. Without vision, people cast off restraint. We're going to pray for you this morning. Father, we just thank you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for a God-given vision, Father. As we lay our hands, let's lay our hands on our eyes, Father. We just thank you for vision, Father, that you cause us to see by vision. I just, I'm thinking about the Apostle Paul when he was on the road to, to the, you know, on a, this roll call straight. And you encountered him there. And you changed his sight and caused him to have vision. And the Bible says that when he had that revelation, something like scales set, fell off of his eyes. So I thank you, Father, that the scales are falling off of our eyes today, Father. Things that are causing us to see life, to see people, to see situations improperly. And I thank you, Father, that you give us corrected vision today. You give us corrected vision. You cause us to see properly. You bring things into alignment for us. And we can start living by your design and by purpose. In Jesus' name, all who agree said, amen.